achieve this, such as transparency and accountability. Now, Mr. Ram, this is an area I know you've written so many publications on for more than a decade, and given all that you have seen, what is your assessment where Guyana is concerned on the issue of good governance? I don't think it is very positive. At the same time, I don't think it's very bad. Okay. Um, we're middling. We should be much better than that. We've had a number of starts. We've never really continued what ought to be done. The PPPC administration had introduced um, access to information legislation. It didn't work very well. Um, the AP and UFC talked about a code of conduct for ministers and public officials. Yes. It didn't work very well. The PPP again had the, um, it was the Integrity Commission mm -hmm. and the Declaration of Assets and Interests and Income and all of those things. And uh, none of those things has really worked well. And, and I, I'm hoping that with this new start of a new administration, that this these issues are going to be taken taken seriously, which is why I think the timing of this program is very good. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned there the Integrity Commission and the Access to Information Act. Both are mechanisms that are central to helping us achieve good governance. What is your take on the success or failings of these two instruments and how can we improve them? Well, look, I've just been appointed um, by cabinet, among mm -hmm. others, as a director of NISIL. Mm -hmm. That immediately brings me on the, the Integrity of Commission, Integrity Act, Integrity Commission Act. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe my appointers should have pointed out to me and to my colleagues on the board, are you prepared to accept and comply the strictures regard set out under the Integrity Commission Act. My affairs, my financial affairs, uh, will now have to be a matter of public record. Mm -hmm. And even if I were to put things in blind trust, they, those things have, must still have to be reported. The fact that it wasn't even drawn to my attention suggests that that culture, that ingrained, ingrained behavior ingrained philosophy do not exist. And you know, it's the PPP was in power for, what, 23 years? Um, and one would have thought it's 23 years plus. I don't regard this as a new government. Mm -hmm. Might be a new administration, is the Ali administration. But the PPP had a lot of time to work out all the kinks and to commit themselves and to show in practice that they were committed to all these um, instruments that we talk about. What we have is a lot of talk and little action. Well, and that is really something that we would need to address going forward, especially with the coming of a lot of wealth from the oil industry. And on that note, I'd like to take you to one of the biggest problems facing Guyana and that is stamping out grand corruption, corruption at the level of government. We seem to be very good at identifying where the issues are and identifying who are the individuals behind it. But we seem to be failing when it comes to securing some level of justice when we find these issues. What do you think is preventing us from going forward in that regard? Well, I think you're being over-optimistic to say that we know. Because everything is done so not only secretly, but secretively, mm -hmm. we don't know much, much, much of what's happening. And so that we think, we make issues. We've had, I recall, under the PPP regime, a big, big issue about um, say the Pradoville issue, the mm -hmm. Myla Falls with Society Global, we talked a lot. It went down. Then the APNU made a whole bunch of commitment. 
Um, they said that they were going to increase ministers' salary because they want to stamp out corruption. And that, that did not happen. And in fact, when you go around and you see the, the kind of salaries and perks that are paid, mm -hmm. I mean, one, one WAG even described, um, we had the, the announcement that someone was um, held the post of director of parks. Yes. Now, what is that? We did not even know until recently. And a WAG decided it was a director of parks. So we have been spending public money without accountability, without transparency, perhaps even without proper accounting, although in respect of accounting, I believe there is more. But until we get a proper functioning, a, a, an effective, I wouldn't say access to information. Look, I got problems with the PPP administration and Transparency Institute had problems with the PPP administration on this access to information act. I think, I think it should be a right to information, right to information, because our constitution guarantees us that right. That access to information act was more to keep information away from the public than to keep it going. And if you were to look, both in, in 2017, there was a nil budget for the Commissioner of Information. In 2018, there was a budget. In 2019, there's nothing. So we, not, we haven't even taken it seriously. I think we need a proper, just how we need an accounting by SARA, we need an accounting for all these agencies. And they must start doing reports. That is what accounting and accountability is all about. We don't have those things. And, and the press thinks, oh, you fill up the paper. And I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking any one press. I, I think it's always difficult. You don't. Know, you can ask, and they, and they can fool you. And if, especially if they don't believe in press conferences and so on, you're not going to get the right information. We don't know. We didn't know that you have people getting close to two million dollars and sometimes more in terms of salaries. What's happening now? The public sector is paying more than the private sector. It's as though there is there's no limit to money. It's as though money is falling from some tree. It's as though we don't have a fiduciary obligation as a government to manage state resources on behalf of the people. And we don't know any of these things. What I would love to see, I would love to see the Ali administration work out a policy paper on payment salaries and terms and conditions to all these contract employees outside of the public service. We have to have a regulated and a streamlined mechanism. Otherwise, every minister decides, I'm going to have this person, just pay them this much money. That is not how it ought to happen. And I believe President Ali has not only the opportunity, but the duty to fix all of those anomalies and improprieties which are now surfacing, not under the Access to Information Act, but just because there's a change of administration. What if there wasn't a change of administration? We wouldn't have known anything. That is true. But on the issue of access to information, I want to just stay on that for a bit. Do you believe that in its current shape or state, it's hindering good governance? The, the, the manner and the mechanism and vehicle through which we can test good governance is by accurate, up-to-date information that is not released only because some good journalists were to ask for it, but it must be part of a system of disclosure by the government, by state agencies, by departments. Because that's where, you know, we, we have so much happening. And it's good that we now have more information as to who was getting, who were getting what, on what terms and conditions. And you know, everybody, it's almost as though it was, as I said before, 
there was no restriction on, on how money was being spent. And that is grossly irresponsible. So you can't have good governance if you don't have information, accurate information, robustly tested, and, and ministers and people and parliament are being able to ask questions. We haven't had parliament for so long. So the, the framework for governance is a problem in this country. And when we talk, I, I don't know if you want me to raise this now, Kiana. Yes, something, go ahead. Something I've been saying endlessly, ages ago. You talk about 10 years. I, I, I've been raising some of these issues for 30 years. I've been around. Political parties are not regulated. They don't yes. have to account for a penny that they, they receive, that they take from this business person and that business person, and then they have to give tax favors. We, the taxpayers, pay for these things. And if this government is serious, it is going to bring legislation to regulate political parties. Could you imagine you are the entity, the instrument that is, wants to run and control this, the resources of the state, and you, on a daily practice in your party, never, never deal, never pay attention to accounting and accountability. We don't know. We're all these probably billions of dollars in these, the March 2nd election campaign. Where did this money come from? How is it accounted for? What kind of dishonesty might have taken place? And business people don't give money for, for nothing. Everything is an investment for a business person. And until we can get, we have to fix that. To me, that is, that is as important as campaign financing. That way, we will get democracy will be strengthened, not only governance. Because you, in some ways, you'll be leveling the playing field. At the moment, is whoever can raise more money and who can take a trip to New York, to Queens, or, or, or to uh, one of the states who, who gets there. And they come back. How do you know when they make these visits, they come back and they declare to the party, oh, we got, I received $15,000. Who said it is $15,000? What kind of accountability there is? We have to fix all of these things if we are serious. Otherwise, we will continue to lag behind. What makes developed countries developed is that they have rule of law, they have accounting, they have accountability, and they have streamlined mechanisms for the conduct public officials in every area of their operation and public life. Do you believe we have enough penalties for those who stray away from Which the penalties? Good we don't have penalties. Not enough. Enough is a surplusage. We don't have penalties. Which one of them? People, people rig elections in this country and seem to get away with it. You know, our Constitution, for all its warts, it, warts, it's not a perfect document. No document is perfect. But it is premised on the rule of law. That's the most fundamental thing. And everybody, we are a republic. The word republic itself has a meaning. From the president down to the lowest commoner like myself must be subject to the same laws. Yes, there are some certain types of immunities and so on, but there's no reason why some of these privileges that, that are enshrined in the 1980 Constitution, and we call it 1980 because that's, it still is the basic framework for the Constitution. We've had lots of amendments since mm -hmm. then, but it is a 1980 Constitution. We have to fix those, um, and our public officials have got to realize, look, you know, we cannot behave as though we're answerable to no one, or only the president, or only some, some power. Mm -hmm. We are all accountable. We must all, all be humble in our dealings with other people's property and assets. 
On the issue of property and assets, I'd like to take you over to uh, looking at the State Asset Recovery Agency. <laughs> I know that you have some pretty strong views about this agency, and it was established with the intention of recovering state assets which were stolen, and we've seen over $400 million expended uh, in going towards that uh, agency. Do you believe, even though there has been uh, concerns about the failings or the success of this agency, that there is still some place for it as we move forward to improve transparency and accountability? There is no question mm -hmm. that there cannot be impunity for anyone who steals or obtains improperly assets of the state. Whether the mechanism is a state asset recovery agency or arising out of the proceeds of, a proceeds of crime act, mm -hmm. it, those are different issues. But that there is a, we, we cannot, you must not benefit from illegal conduct, from criminal conduct. And we have to deal with, you know, Anil Nanalala, when you, New York, um, Attorney, Attorney General, General once again. He loves to talk about the word condignly. He got it from Burnham. That's how we've got to treat people. The, 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 the era and the concept of the big one, you can't touch them because all you have to do is call this minister and he's going to talk to the commissioner of police. No, no, no. Ministers must speak policy to the executive, not give instructions. They must set out clearly their policy, and that itself will be a test. And if they don't observe it, because some codes of conduct require annual declaration. I confirm that I have observed all the requirements of the code of conduct, etc., etc., and that is done annually. That's the kind of behavior we want to encourage. So, so sorry, go ahead. To get back to your question, mm -hmm. we, need, we need legislation that allows for the recovery of state assets unlawfully obtained. OK. We have to find the mechanism. And not, not every country has gone the asset recovery agency route. We have had a most expensive process. It is, it is to distinguish Professor Clive Thomas's eternal discredit mm -hmm. that his leadership of sorrow has been so devoid of results. On that note, I'm going to take you over to the Special Organized Crime Unit, which is another agency that's responsible for assisting in the fight of anti-corruption and financial crimes. There has been a damning report that was released on the financial transgression and various forms of corruption that took place in Soku. It, it was spoken about by many tra local transparency advocates, and it was published in many of the daily newspapers. How do we get institutions that are supposed to be helping in the fight of anti-corruption, how do we get them to do that if they themselves are infested with corruption? How do we begin to tackle that issue? You know, Kiana, one of the characteristics of human beings, we are not perfect. Mm -hmm. And in every agency, whether you're talking about the intelligence agency, the spy agency, and whatever, you have people who sell out. You have to be prepared for that. In terms of Soku, Soku's rightful place is under the commissioner of police. It is a department of the police force, a specialized agency. Special Organized Crime Unit. Mm -hmm. It found itself engaged um, it often in political issues. And I can tell you, you talk about report. There are some things that Soku 
investigated. That never came to fruition because big ones were involved. And here again, this concept of annual reports. Now, an investigation, of course, does not establish guilt. Okay. It establishes um, evidence, and then you take it to court. But uh, again, my concern, and you know, it's going to happen with small societies. People who, who um, know somebody, and, and, and this culture of corruption. We have a culture that we don't even think it's corrupt. You see, you, you, you pass a police station and people out on the road and, uh, you know, they say, give, give, me, give me something to buy, you. buy something. And you think, look, think how hard these guys are working, mm -hmm. the low salaries. What they don't realize is that culture of corruption that causes the collection of revenue for the state to be reduced and the money that is paid to them thereby reduced. We need to start addressing, professionalizing our police force, insulating them from political directions and directives, and making sure that they are treated as professionals, they're paid reasonable salaries, and, and held accountable they too must be held accountable for the work they do and if they collect bribe they must they must pay the consequences we still have situation where you hear the police or you go and bring the police i'll go and bring the police and you you use the police as a type of improper enforcer all of those things have got to stop it's not easy it's not it's not going to be addressed overnight all we've got to do is look at the developed countries, especially England and the United States. But we have to start someplace. And, and sometime, and this is why I'm saying President Ali has both an opportunity and a duty. He's coming in like a new kid on the block, set the standards. He's got to start, I hope he said, at his first cabinet meeting, I do not wish to hear a single complaint about any one of you in terms of taking bribe, of in influence peddling, or, or awarding things to friends and family. That's been the part of our culture. Ali, President Ali had a duty, in my view, to say that at his first meeting. I think every board of directors needs to have a code of conduct for its members. What it does, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be perfect. We all can go to heaven. But it will make them conscious when they have to sign that annual certificate that I have complied. They must have some nagging sense of guilt to know, you know, this is not true. And you, you have them answering questions. We probably need an ombudsman for corruption. And corruption is reported and properly investigated and resources put to having proper investigators. Okay. I am going to take you now to the Auditor General's report which is year after year replete with a lot of financial transgressions, but we don't necessarily see uh, justice being meted out for many of these things that the Auditor General would report on. So on that note, I'd like to ask you, what do you believe the Auditor General should do more in order to get justice for the mismanagement of tax dollars? What more would you suggest he do? Well, I'm, I'm not going to, to defend the Auditor General. He can only do as much as the resources entrusted to him so permit. Clearly, they need far greater resources to get a proper functioning Auditor General 
office. You need in every ministry. You almost must have real-time kind of audits. You need to remove a lot of discretionary spending, particularly by ministers. You need permanent secretaries who accept the responsibility that they are the financial officers. And if money is spent and they cannot account for it, then they must pay. Until we have strong enforcement mechanism or the threat of strong enforcement mechanism, you're going to always get a situation. Now, when you read of what, of some of these things that are coming out, you have to ask yourself, where were the auditors? That's a common refrain whenever you hear something. We went to Republic Bank meeting last year, you know, and that was the question. Auditors ought to answer, and in this case, the state audit. They ought to answer for all of these acts of corruption that are not unearthed. And they must ask themselves, well, why, how come this slipped us? And to make sure that there is mechanism that it wouldn't happen again. But we, we, we need the resources and as I said, you need almost real-time audit. But look, the disgrace, the Durban Park um, rehabilitate, or not rehabilitate, development, one point something billion dollars. The, the Mazaroni prison, you, you hear, um, maybe it's anecdotal. You hear of how much more the contract was awarded for than it should be. We need to get an engineering profession. You need to get a procurement commission not a procurement commission that, that feathers its own nest and is more concerned about looking after or, 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 or is not sufficiently robust in the kind of work it does. We are a small country. I think, I think we have it within, within us. If we don't address these problems, the resource curse is going to continually and continuously live with us. And we will never realize and achieve the potential which the blessings of all of these natural resources endow our country and our people with. On the issue of audits, Mr. Ram, you would have uh, been contracted by the Granger administration in 2015 to do some forensic audits on agencies, and you've also been asked by the PPP to do a similar type of audit. When you look at the findings from those two activities, what for you are some of the chronic weaknesses that need to be addressed if we're to improve good governance? The premise of your question is not quite correct. Okay. The, the, in, in the Ali administration, it was just a rapid um, assessment where things are, what, what, what resources are available um, in terms of the major entities, and, and we didn't deal with every single ministry or anything like that. Um, in, the, in the case of the Grange administration, it was, these were comprehensive, special investigations, they were called forensic audits. That, that, that's somewhat of a misnomer, but it was close enough to that the appellation was not particularly misplaced. So your risk assessment was not to identify? No, it, it, you, you didn't have the kind of time. It's, it's, you're not going into underlying records um, to see that, that an expenditure was necessary. You didn't go to transactions as such. Is where are we? What, okay. what, what, what resources are available. Okay, um, I understand. I was very disappointed that the Granger administration, um, possibly because they didn't prosecute the matters competently enough, okay. did not s succeed in getting some sort of results. And what has happened, Kiana, what worries me, instead of the Granger administration saying, you know what, 
these were the findings, and the, a large number of it was not the one firm, it's almost all audit firms in Guyana had been uh, contracted to do various audits. The least I expected them to say, what lessons can we draw from what these audits unearthed? And instead what happened? Shortly after we had a Sussex Street bond. Yes, the, the, this, I remember This that. government has had its fair share. And to get to the point, the bar keeps getting low. Instead of getting higher, it is getting low. So by, because the, the APNU government did not say, well, look, you know, the mistakes made by the PPP administration will not be repeated by us. They, they did almost the same kinds of things. Some of the things like, you know, um, almost unaccounted payment to, to these contract employees for, for whatever they're doing, you're not quite sure. But that's not to say the, the APNO government did not do things. It had this commission of inquiry into public service. Um, it sought to reduce the number of contract employees, but then this, the, the money that was saved from those people paid um, really large packages. The, that you almost have to say there's an element of gift or reward in some of those packages. The gratuity and the, the, or the car and the driver and the chauffeur and, uh, and the, the gardener and maid. Look at Harmon's package. Look at Imran Khan's package. How can you justify this in a country that its overdraft is ballooning? The only way we disguised our overdraft is because we had um, about $50 billion in treasury bill. It was previously unfunded. It was previously funded. It's now unfunded. So it, it manipulated the figures. Wow. And this is why I'm saying sometimes, you know, I, I believe newspaper people are not sufficiently well paid, but our, culture, our country doesn't pay, the, you know, the, the kind of money that, that businesses can afford to pay for advertisements. So it's, it's, it's one big circle, um, and, and a vicious one at that. The fact that you've got, I was working out today, uh, the salary, what the person at the bottom gets and what the person at the top gets, 25 and 30%, 30 times. That should not happen. We create an uneven and an unequal society. And because these people are so well positioned and so well, well healed and deep pocketed, they get away with all kinds of things. I believe the Ali administration has got to this, address this question of our society. This, this low wage economy can't work. Otherwise, our people will keep migrating and migrating. You can, you can go and work two weeks in one of the islands and come back and get money for maybe two months. So why not do that? The, the challenges are many. I, I, I wouldn't like to be mm -hmm. in, in Ali shoes at this stage. And that's not only because of my age. I, it's, it's really, really a formidable problem. But this is what greatness is made of when you can transform what you have inherited to something that you would, would be an everlasting source of pride for what you will get, leave for future generations. And that's the opportunity Ali has. He better not blow it. I want to take you to another issue of accountability and transparency, and that's the uh, 2016 production sharing agreement that was signed with ExxonMobil and the Granger administration. There were a lot of concerns about what really uh, went into that entire process, who was really informing the minister, why did he accept such a deal, and there were calls for an investigation into this matter. Those calls were recently renewed by Global Witness, which is a very uh, reputable uh, transparency body. 
And I want to know what is your take on that call for an investigation and for a renegotiation to uh, give us the kind of resources that would help us strengthen institutions for good governance? Well, I certainly believe there ought to be, apart from the investigation that's going on, mm -hmm. or, or this technical assessment, I think there ought to be a commission of inquiry. And you know, Kiana, the answer is simple now. The PPPC has access to the cabinet papers. There has been this concern, was this matter taken to cabinet or not? That answer is, is five minutes. All we have to do, whoever is the cabinet secretary, somebody, and maybe you, Kiana, here's your opportunity to go and say, can I get a copy of the cabinet submissions? One has to assume there's more than one. Mm -hmm. Can I get copies of the cabinet submissions, the cabinet papers on these matters? You know, the Clyde and Company report. Yes. It was a very damning report. Yes. But we seem to have forgotten that. We know that Exxon bullied Trotman and the APNO government, and they incompetently allowed themselves to be bullied. And that's, the, that's about the best spin you could give, because you don't want to, to, to raise specter of corruption. The best spin you can give is gross incompetence on the part of Trotman and the APNU AFC government. We have an opportunity. Now, we've signed such a deal mm -hmm. with such a stability clause. Yes. Right up to 2056. Now, you know, you people are going to be around then. The Exxon will be there. In fact, they said for the next 100 years. What I thought they were doing is when they asked for this present project, they, they said, oh, we must have it. Now, we don't have winter in Guyana. It's not like they had to have it because the, the weather would have changed. The, 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 the tide is not going to change. So it was, it was really a repetition of what they succeeded with in the case of Trotman. Agreed to this thing quickly, and then a couple of days later announced the, a major fine. That's what they were hoping to do here. We are stuck with a, with a very onerous contract, onerous to us. Hess boasts that it's, it's a jewel in the crown. Yes. You know, they, they even use royalty, even though they're Republicans. They cannot appear to be totally insensitive to, the, to Guyana. And I'm hoping that good sense will prevail. Guyana means a lot to ESO or Exxon, CNOP, Nexin, and Hess. Well, Hess has already said that. I think we have to persuade them that this contract cannot stand. In my view, there are elements of it that were illegal. Mm -hmm. And certainly, it was a case of they using or misusing their powers in getting that agreement, which some would argue they weren't even entitled to. You're entitled to a single petroleum agreement. They had one in 1999. And then they come back and behave as though they're new kids on the block. No Exo, no Exxon, that's not true. You're not new kids on the block. You knew everything what you were doing and you, you took advantage of the gullible up no OFC administration, but I would hope, and I'm challenging you now, Kiana, the next time you meet 
Prime Minister, Vice President, President, or the Minister of Natural Resources, you ask for the cabinet papers. I certainly will. <laughs> I can assure you that. I certainly will. And that will, that, that will remove a lot, and it will also be very instructive. But Mr. Ram, do you believe that the Ali administration, uh, with all that you've said about the contract, that it cannot stand and some parts of it having illegal provisions, do you believe that there's still an opportunity for the Ali administration to correct the things that you've identified? Let me tell you this. I would congratulate the ad Ali administration on standing up to Exxon, Hess, and Zenoc Nixon, mm -hmm. and saying, look, don't rush me, and I am going to get this, con this whole contract and this whole plan reviewed. And it's, it's to Canada's credit as well that in as much as Zenoc Nixon has both Chinese and Canadian connection, it has said it is willing to play a part in looking at this. But the Ali administration, I'm particularly pleased about this. They knew, they must know, that without the Americans and the British and the Canadians and the US, they would probably not have been in government now. But despite that, despite the remarkable contribution by the US ambassador, Mm -hmm. the Guyana government said that's implicitly said that's one thing this contract is another and we reserve the right notwithstanding to your great contribution to ensuring the, and, and Pompeo and, you know the, 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 almost the highest level mm -hmm. in the US government stood up for democracy in Guyana and almost immediately we challenge uh, one of the blue chip American companies. And it's good that those matters have been treated as separate. And I am looking forward. I'm, what I'm disappointed in, I believe the Ali administration should hold public consultation. Don't only ask Canadians, don't only ask foreigners, why not have open consultation in Guyana on the same issues? After all, it is our patrimony. It is not theirs. We welcome their contribution. But in the final analysis, if you are saying this is our patrimony, then give us a voice. So I'm looking forward to the Ali administration doing exactly that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ram, we're going to wrap up this evening's program, which has been very insightful thus far for the first uh, start. And I'd like to ask you uh, your concluding thoughts on how Guyana should move forward, the Ali administration, in pursuing uh, stronger systems for ensuring good governance and the fight against corruption and ensuring justice, what do we need to do in order to improve our stance where those things are concerned? Well, to start with, and, and, and this more s summarizing rather than, mm -hmm. yeah, they have got to show that they themselves, that they are setting serious standards for themselves, that they will put in place a code of conduct that regardless of whom, you know, um, and it's, it's not a secret. Lots of Guyanese are very upset that Robert Passaud, the former Minister of Natural Resources, has been brought back with a top position in this administration. Um, there are serious concerns about that. Um, one does know why they, they took that decision, because I, I think at a stroke of the pen, they opened themselves the honeymoon period is over. And the press is going to start judging them a little bit more, more harshly than they otherwise might. So they've got to get that going. They've got to get access to information. They've got to treat the auditor office with more resources. They've got to bring political party legislation. 
and they have got to show that look, they will run Guyana, not to reward, and this is one of the problems between March 2nd and August 2nd, not only the PPP, all, everybody became dependent on help from here, there, and everywhere. And then you've got to return kindnesses. I saw politicians take help from, from businesses to, to an extent that causes me great concern. But it was maybe necessitated by the circumstances resulting from the fraudulent attempt to rig the elections by Mingo, by Lowenfield, by Vola Lawrence, and others. So it's a big responsibility, but you know, to behave properly doesn't take a lot out of you. All you've got to do is say, look, I will start now. I will ask my governance minister to get me a proper code of conduct within X days. I recall Gail Tashir and I had issues over transparency in the, and, and the, the access to information legislation. We need to repeal that and replace it with a, an effective act and an effective commissioner that is powerful, that has the power, and that people must be provided with information within a short period of time. 120 days is far, far too long because you could stretch it out under the existing act, you could do that. I'm hopeful that the Ali administration is going to do this. If they don't, I would be very, very disappointed. And if we don't get this, Kiana, I said to, to a colleague of mine in the office today, if these things aren't put in place, I would never vote, assuming I live for the next election. I would never vote in an election in Ghana again. I feel that strongly about it. Okay, well, Mr. Ram, I would like to thank you for the insightful uh, perspectives that you've offered on our program, uh, governance, corruption, and justice. And I do hope to have you back uh, for a few more sessions. This really has been uh, insightful, and I know that our viewers on Facebook Live and those listening to us, wherever you are, uh, I'm sure that this would have been an informative session for you as well. To everyone, thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope that you can join us next week, same time, same place, for another discussion on governance, corruption, and justice. Good night. Thank, and thank you very you, much. Mr. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Ram. Kaicher Radio. Covering Guyana from coast to coast. Demerara and Essequibo 99.1 FM. Furby's 99.5 FM. Kaicher Radio. Kaicher Radio. Keeping you informed. Demerara and Essequibo 99.1 FM. Furby's 99.5 FM. Kaicher.